Hey everyone, it's Classy DM. We're going to move on to our next little section here of the Rise of Aya's behind the scenes as we're developing this campaign before we start running it. And one topic we want to go over today is our construction of the narrative and how the storylines are going to hook with the different characters we have created. So let's just jump right into it. So with any kind of adventure, you're going to need to have, especially one like this that has pre-generated characters, the players are going to want to know like where these characters come from, how much of my personality can I infuse into the character, um, you know, what's their backstory? How do they get involved in the situation? What's the inciting incident? What's going on in the adventure? So this video is going to kind of answer those kinds of questions and talk about it from the perspective of what I've got created, where the flexibility is for you ultimately if you run this yourself. Because the plan in the long term is to distribute this for free so people can take it and run their own adventure with it, right? So you're kind of getting to see, like, how do I create this stuff on my own? And then along the way, you'll be able to figure out ways that you want to modify it and change it too. So let's talk more focused about narrative. On the right-hand panel here, we've kind of got this inciting incident. And... I'm just going to read this to you real quickly, and then we're going to break it down in reverse and talk about where these characters come from and what they're all about. And I'm going to pop open a large map of Greyhawk here on the left as we go through this. So Ios is on the move. So when you're playing this adventure, this is kind of what you would read to players in that first day. You know, they got the characters, they've they've looked through the character sheets, they they figured out who's going to play the fighter, who's going to play the cleric, who's going to play the assassin, who's going to play the monk, who's going to play the druid, who's going to play the elf magic user, or if you want to, there's nothing wrong with them having their own characters. For the sake of having this show put together, we have pre-generated characters. So they need to understand like what's the situation at hand, what's our challenge, and what are we supposed to do. So here's the situation. Um the winds of war begin to blow. Scouts report the armies of Ayas move south from Daraka, establishing a military war camp on the north bank of the Ving River near Grabford. In the south, legions of red-haired barbarians and black landed on the west shores of the Woolly Bay, crossed through the Welkwood Forest, and established a stronghold near Homlet. You listened intently as the scouts delivered their reports. The leaders of Valuna, Foriandi, and Selene discussed the next crucial step in the fate of nations. As the Council of Nations ends, your mentors gather. The army of Valuna is to move north Chintindal, to Chindal, the capital city of Friandi. Once the two armies join, Aya should stand down. If not, we move north to check Aya's aggressive stance. The forces of Selene, the Gnarly Forest, and the Lortmill Mountains are to prepare to move if called upon. However, we need to know if these reports of a southern force are true, and if so, are they connected to Aya's plans? Infiltrate Homlet. Discover what forces are at play. Intercept communication. Collect intelligence. Dispatch what you find and then disrupt and disable. So when you're running a campaign, this like first thing you read on your first page of your module, they kind of like set the stage like this. And this is what we have going on here. The characters don't really know how they got here. They, they've picked a character to play. They picked one of the characters we showed you a few moments ago. They're not sure you know, too much about maybe even the world of Greyhawk. They don't understand this whole region. They don't understand that this is Valuna. They don't understand this is Foyendi. They never heard of the Gnarly Forest or the Kron Hills or Babank or Valuna City or the Lort Mill Mountains or Selene. So our adventure pretty much takes place with reference to famous characters and kings and queens and of nations that have gathered together to check an attack of Ayas. Ayas is the nation that's above here, and this is the city called Daraka, which is the capital of Ayas. Now, if you've ever played the Temple of Elemental Evil in the past, we all know that Ayaz is almost like a demigod of chaotic evil, appears as an old man. Um, and, but the real story behind the, the original Temple of Elemental Evil is this Zugumotoi, or however you want to pronounce it, kind of um, fungi-related demigod rising up with the Temple of Elemental Evil, attracting a bunch of followers by expanding her ideas, being to the different, you know, the different air, earth, fire, and wind type fire type of nodes. So by attracting followers that are from chaotic evil forces to follow under the, under the realm of fire or of ice or wind or whatever you have, whatever the elemental evils are is a way for that fungi type force to bra draw in a bunch of power. Now, in the actual history of this, if you read on the on the line, when most people play the village of Hamlet, all that stuff's gone down. It's been destroyed. Aya's in this uh, Zugmotor, or however you want to pronounce it. Leave a comment if you know how to pronounce her name. Um, that's already been smashed. They've already been destroyed. There's been a big battle at Emerity Fields like we talked about in our previous episode. But in this adventure, we're going back before that. So before that, Aya's doesn't know what's going on down here. Ayaz doesn't really know what's going on. He was already doing what he wanted to do, which was he wants to wipe out 
the kingdom of Foryandi, which is here, and the kingdom of Valuna, which is here. The Horn Society has always been kind of an evil player, player in the world of Greyhawk, but he decides that he's going to gather his armies, which is a mixed bag of evil men and soldiers and knights and orcs and who knows what else is at his dispatch disposal. It almost reminds me of the opening scene of Lords of Destruction for Diablo 2. Um, so he moves this army down here. Now, if you look very closely, you see this is the Ving River coming off this Whistle Lake all down to the near dire uh, big lake with famous you know, lake of bottom of de depths in the world of Greyhawk. So he's moved his forces to this side of this kind of bump here in the river. And each one of these hexes is 30 miles across. And Grabford is still kind of considered part of the kingdom of Furiandi. Chindle, which is here, is the capital of Furiandi. And Furiandi and Valuna get along. There's like a princess betrothed to a princess and all kinds of crazy backstory. The prince ends up dead and the Temple of Elemental Evil and all kinds of crazy things happen with the history of the world of Greyhawk. So in this situation, our players begin in Voluna City. So you're kicking the game off with the characters already at some you know magnificent palace, maybe right outside the boardroom, right? And imagine like this massive meeting between the kings and the queens and you're there listening. You're like four rows back and your characters are playing someone that's along with some massive entourage, right? And as these scouts give all these uh, descriptions of what's going on, your mentor who are famous leaders that are part of this you know, conglomerate of this council of nations are going to turn to you and ask you to do something because all these armies are going to gather together and meet up here so they can go check, meaning like stop the advance of the forces of Aya. So all that has nothing to do with what's going to go on down here, which is part of the fun. So the players are going to be part of an adventure that connects to the history of the world of Greyhawk, but is something that happens later. So it's almost like I was there when the stuff went down back in the day. So it's kind of one of these back of the day storyline checks for you to develop for your players. So the good thing is, if you do have a player who already knows all the history of Greyhawk, knows the Ayas and this fungi princess is going to do some kind of elemental evil and knows about the village of Hama, despite the thing they've ran it or they know it or everything, everything is different because it's like 45 years before this all happened. So despite all that, they may know as a player, their characters don't know that. So the characters are walking into a situation where things are kind of tricky. Let's go on and talk about those characters real quick before we move any further. So when you have a pre-generated set of characters and they're kind of involved in this international conglomerate, I was on like NATO getting the other and go make some massive, you know, it's like the five eyes, going to go do some military action to stop some evil forces. How do your piddly little level one characters, you know, your, your dwarf and your cleric, your assassin, your monk and a magic user and the druid, how do they all tie into this? So the idea behind the characters is they all kind of come from this southern region that surrounds the village of Hamet. And the village of Hamet is always kind of considered to be a right around here, just south of Verbalbank, and where it says uh, Kron Hills, like where the L, the letter L is. So our characters come from these different regions. A lot of them we fictitiously have modified from the original Greyhawk. So let's go through that real quickly. So our fighter, which is this Orsta character here, we call him Orsta Ulviksen, to give him a cool kind of Viking name, right? So he comes from this region right here. Now the Lortmill Mountains are huge. This is a massive, you know, spine of the world slash Himalayan type style mountain. And you can see there's little dashed lines that show a little mountain pass that connects between this region to the south all over this area here of Selene, which is predominantly uh, occupied by elves, right? So the dwarves have always been notations in the world of Greyhawk, Gazetteer, and all these other books about how dwarves have pockets of empires along these mountains near the Kron Hills and on the other side. So in this situation, we created kind of this fictitious dwarven group who's doing mining or whatever, a military force, that live on the base of this mountain. You know, it's almost like what you see in the Lord of the Rings, right? So you have this dwarven community living here, and that's where Orsta comes from. So whether it's Orsta's father or his grandfather or his uncle or someone, Orsta, who's young, you know, dwarves aren't necessarily young, is a young fighter, hasn't proven himself, maybe done military service, maybe done some scholarly stuff. You know, he's qu pretty adept at fighting. I mean, just look at his ability scores, right? I mean, he's 16 strength. He's got 17 dexterity, 18 constitution. So he's, he's hardened. He's trained. He just doesn't have the worldly experience to do something incredible yet. So he's not level, he's not level four or five, six and seven. He's just starting out. So his adventuring experience is going to begin with this adventure. So despite all that, that doesn't mean he's a chump. It doesn't mean he's some 18-year-old dummy. I mean, this guy could have 30 years of experience. There's 
there's lots of people that have been in the military that were in the Air Force for 20 years and never saw any action. Doesn't mean they don't have any experience. So in this kind of situation, Orsta comes from here. So he's moved up to Voluna City with an entourage representing his community. So next we have um, Emma Lamore. Let's pull her character sheet up. She's Emma Lamore Dreva is from Voluna City. Um, the Voluna City is a very religious city. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a Cuthbert religion. Someone can correct me on that. But even so, even if you do want to use the St. Cuthbert religion, it's a strong, uh, pious, paladin-led kind of a kingdom, something almost like you see in France or whatever, maybe in Italy in the Middle Ages, something that has a pope and things like that. So you have this kind of Catholicism type of connection going on. So a very religious, very pious you know, lawful good type of community, maybe a little chaotic, neutral happening along the edges here. She's a young uh, cleric who's part of this massive clergy group, hasn't really decided where she lies, but for some reason, due to her relationships, whether her father's an ambassador or a military leader, or she's been involved in military service, or she's been doing a cleric with the clergy, for whatever reasons, she's in on this meeting that happens at Voluna City. Now, if you and I were going to go to uh, an important meeting somewhere, let's say it was at the the United Nations, right? We're just regular people. We're gamers. We play role-playing games and we play D&D or &D whatever. And I'm assuming no one listened to this video channel as a senator or Republican or something like that or some kind of member of the House of Representatives or some not an international diplomat. Regular run-of-the-mill people. So if you knew someone, like if your uncle was a senator and your or your father was an ambassador or your mom was an ambassador and this is a really important meeting, they might want to have you kind of tag along to come along, maybe setting the stage for the future of your career right this is something that happened a lot in the middle ages um, family was kept together Ele families were elevated by bringing the young children involved with you know matters of court and things like that so this is kind of the stage that we have for this meeting happening in Voluna City so for, for Emma Lamore she's part of that so this whole council meeting that's happening that's mentioned up here in this previous section the the Council of Nations um, this is in her backyard this is her city so all these other national groups are coming to meet in this city City, and she's the host city so she's there on this on the scene as well now next we have Seamus <laughs> or Seamus now Sh Seamus shoveling the embalmer this is a gnome now we got a picture here from Black Desert Online it's really a human but that's the best we could get because I couldn't find a really great screenshot of something of high quality that would for, fit for a gnome but we used this pirate outfit to him to kind of capture his uh you know assassin type attitude so this is a, chaos, a neutral evil uh, assassin so we kept him on the neutral evil side because we want him to be kind of a deceiver guy he's a young assassin he's done some cool stuff most of his focus in life is on poison and i did a video earlier uh, that you may see that talks about those characters in more detail so how does he fit in so seamus kind of comes to this region right here it's on the far western part of the cron hills the cron hills is is labeled as being an area that has a lot of gnome population and the gnome population doesn't all mean a bunch of neutral evil gnomes so by being way on the outskirts he's gotten into more trouble maybe done some uh, black market sales worked on some poison done some things maybe he hasn't done any maybe assassinations or anything like that yet but he's worked on some thieving skills and he's kind of fallen into a group where that's kind of what he wants to do so for whatever reason um, his when the entourage from the Cron Hills goes north to Valuna they perhaps asked someone from his community to go up there and he weaseled his way into the situation thinking there might be some cool opportunities for him to do something in Valuna. But it's not just a hanger on. He's not a stowaway. You know, his father or his mother or his brother or somebody's important. Someone important who's not neutral evil from the Cron Hills. They say, yeah, well, bring your brother Seamus along. We need to get him up there and sort him out anyway. So he's a, he's up there involved in that large meeting as well. Next one we have is Rhea. Uh, let's go down to her character sheet. Rhea Endear. Now, this is a monk. So the way we designed her is really kind of be a almost like a martial arts slash uh, Mongolian Empire style monk kind of like we have with the tiger nomads and the glacial rift or frost giant jarl and the uh, steading of the hill giant chief for her we tried to pick her a spot as hidden in the lort mill mountains at the end of this river where this river flows from so in the lort mill mountains if you look on the map here um, the river kind of comes out of the side of the mountain so this would be a great place to have a beautiful lake really high elevations all kind of stoicism happening on whatever monks are doing to perfect their martial arts she uses a glaive as her weapon so this is a real true pure martial artist only in unarmed combat and using her glaive so everything about her 
her lawful neutral life comes from this region. That region might be highly respected. So between Valuna and the Cron Hills and Selene, the Gnarly Forest and Furiandi, you know, the monks from this region might be highly regarded for their knowledge or their stoicism or their willingness to assist the forces of good. So for whatever reason, whether her mentor or her master who is teaching her or her sister or her brother or someone, they're asked to go along at this meeting at the Council of Nations. So she's there too. So having the family connection is a key thing to this adventure if you're running it for your friends. I think if you can make the family connection, you don't really need to flush out those family characters too much in too much detail. You can say it's your father, your uncle. Um, if you want your players to design their own backstories, they can. But you don't want to get bogged down too much trying to have a, a role-playing this scene. You don't want to pull out a battle map of the throne room and putting 40 miniatures in there and all this kind of business. Because characters will start running downstairs into the city streets like the city-state Invincible Overlord and trying to rob everyone. Right. So what you want to do is just use this as a kind of like a film scene in their mind. Just the theater of the mind work for them. So when Rhea, she's up there as well, like I mentioned a moment ago. So when things go down and they decide to give the mission to this group of characters, she's given a mission as well. Let's move on to our next character, which is Liz Fannin. Uh, Liz Fannin is an elf. She comes from uh, the kingdom of Selene, the Enstot, which is the capital of Selene. So if you look over here on the map here, this is Selene. This is Enstot. Um, this region is led by this noble queen. This entire valley here is completely sheltered by these mountains. There's a few mountain passes that pass in between here and here but then you have these beautiful welkwood forests which is like all redwoods you're talking like 200 foot tall trees and that kind of insulates this area here with the river here and the river here it's kind of like a pocket of elven happiness right so on the other side this is the wild coast and you got pirates and orcs and all kinds of nasty business and raiders going up and down the woolly bay so the elves are very sheltered and protected in this open grassy green field type area here remember each hex is about 30 feet so when it comes time for the uh for Celine to go there her stud the the leader of Selene herself, I think it was Yolanda, if I remember correctly, um, to go to this council of um, of the different nations, the Council of Nations in Valuna, she's brought along for whatever reason. Like maybe her primary wizard mentor is having her go. She needs to learn some diplomacy. Maybe the Mirren family, which is her last name, Mirren family is involved in this. So she's brought along too. And it's quite a long trip. So traveling each one of these 30 hexes to get here, this is like 360, 380 miles. It's not happening in a weekend, okay? You can look up in your DM's guide how far you can move in a day. So she's there and she's from Enstot. So she's coming from yet another capital city. So you can almost see kind of early on on how Emma Lamore is coming from Valuna with this very pious, human-oriented type of a culture. And you got Liz Fannin coming from this sheltered, different type of stoic attitude of this sheltered elven kingdom from Selene. They come from almost opposites, if you know what I mean. So that you can see a situation where the two females can have some kind of conflict going on. Now mix that up with the female monk with Rhea. You've got another person neutrally intervening between the three. So having the female, three female characters kind of not getting on well is a great opportunity for some role playing for your players or for how they make decisions on how they're going to do things. That's where you'll see a lot of times when we play this adventure later on, when there's major decisions, everyone's charisma is going to come and play, which is going to be very interesting because, um, Liz Fannin's a 14 charisma. We got a 14 charisma on Emma Lamore. We just call her Emma. And Rhea's only got a 9 charisma. So, you know, the monk isn't the best leader in the world. She's also not the smartest. So she's very inexperienced. Her philosophical view on life might give her a way to somewhat intervene, but she's not going to have the, the diplomatic argumentative skills of this these two here who are going to get into it a lot and argue about what to do. So these two are probably going to struggle with being the leader of the group throughout the entire campaign and the charisma of the dwarven fighter he's not going to really care and then you're going to have the high charisma of the assassin kind of slip in between the two of them and, and prompting the two girls to argue all the time so you can see a little drama happening and i think we want that to happen in our adventure because it happens in real life too but of course sometimes in real life it's not that fun but we want to make this kind of a situation where the characters playing through the adventure are like as if they were real people and real actors now we're not going to voice act them or do stuff like that but we're going to control the situation for these characters building upon the relationships of the characters like you would see in a Baldur's Gate game or an Icewind Dale game. Let's get back to our review of the last two characters here. Last one, Aragal. Aragal is a druid. Aragal Fahir is it's kind of a mix between an Irish name and a Nordic name. Um, he's a human druid. He's from the Welkwood Forest. As I mentioned earlier, as you see this battle map here, the Welkwood Forest is this huge, massive redwoods. So you may remember when I was reading a few moments ago what what the scouts were saying, really. So you see here about, they talk about Darak, uh, Isis forces go and move south from Daraka, which is their capital city, which is here, 
right, which is, excuse me, right up here. And they move south to this area right here. Now, when we're mentioning these other guys coming in from the Woolly Bay and crossing through the forest, that means that Druid and his scouts and the other Druids in his group and the Rangers and everyone else in his area, and they're all humans, they know about this. So maybe some of the scouts that are reporting this information to Valuna is why Aragal's along for the ride. So he's someone that already has a little bit of insight into the, who the enemies are. And we're talking about what the enemies might be. We're saying things like, you know, these are going to be these redheaded guys like we did before. So what we did is we created all all these let's move these kids out of the way for a second we took all these extra minis we had we made them all red haired right it's not because we're a big fan of red hair or anything but we wanted to make these enemies that were kind of this viking raider style wild black wearing evil diabolical maybe they're a fire node kind of follower so the enemies are all this dark red barbarian evil bad guys type of a look. So when our heroes are going up against them, Aragorn's already kind of seen them. He's seen them move through the forest. He knows what's going on with them. So those kinds of details, I think, are, uh, are a really, really neat way to do it. And we're going to talk about the map here in just a moment. But let's go back to the world of Greyhawk map and talk about where this uh, Aragorn comes from. So Aragorn is coming from this region here. Uh, he comes from the Gnarly Forest, and the, so he knows this whole region really, really well. The Darley Forest is one of the major players that was in one of the major battles, the Battle of Emrity Fields that happens before the Temple of Elemental Evil. So you got all this kind of Lord of the Rings kind of stuff happening in the background. So how does it all kick off? Well, what you want to do as a dungeon master, you've, if you've got the characters picked, you give them this brief little rundown of where they come from. The real reason for them being there is not that important. But the bottom line is that they are at this council meeting, okay? This council of nations in Voluna City. And the village of Hama has always been traditionally considered to be in the Kron Hills here, south of Verbombank. So this is kind of the inciting instance of the whole adventure, right? So the characters are part of the entourages from their home regions attending a meeting, the Council of Nations, in Voluna City. From there, their mentors gather and band them together with a specific mission. So imagine you're at work one day and your boss says, hey, I need everyone from this department and this department let's get together on the eighth floor and have a conversation, right? So you're kind of just, okay, I got to show up, right? And so these entourages are taking you on this journey to Voluna City. You don't really say no. So you're there when this big meeting happens. And then the group pull the six of you aside, which are in some ways representing your different nationalities, which gives you this diverse background from Orsta, Emma Moore, Seamus, Rhea, Liz Fannin, and Aragal. Now you're kind of charged with a mission. And what is that mission? The infiltrate Hamlet, discover what forces are at play, intercept communication, collect intelligence, dispatch what you find, and then disrupt and disable. Now, really smart players can be like, how do we do the dispatches? How are we going to disrupt this? How are we going to do that? Well, that's part of the challenge. Now, what you can do as a dungeon master, you can say, well, listen, here's what's going to happen every Every seven days on a certain moon, there's going to be an elven rider from Selene who's going to come at this certain location, almost like the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion, if you ever played that game from Zenimax or uh, Bethesda Studios or whatever, which is really fun. Well, you know, it's really old now. It's like from 2007 or 6. Um, you may have to do a drop. So there may be a situation where you leave, you write up a scroll that says, here's what we found, here's what we discovered, this, we think this is happening, and then an elven rider will pick it up with a drop anonymously and then ride back to Selene. They'll figure out through their network how to dispatch this information back up north to Valuna and the Kingdom of Furyandy. So, but you're going to be on your own. It's kind of like Twilight 2000. You're on your own. So your characters that you're playing, your players, they know they need to go to Hamlet. So what happens? So now that you're establishing that the characters are entering this unknown territory, they're really entering enemy territory. And it's really important because the way this stuff is written here in the beginning is we're all talking about war and how Ios is moving down from the north and we're worried about what's happening in the south. It's kind of like what happened in World War II where you have Russia and Germany and Italy, Mussolini and Stalin and Hitler all moving and shuffling things around from 1937 to 1940 before things really kick into high gear. I mean, Mussolini attacked Algeria, if you can even believe it, if you know your world history a little bit. So this is a situation kind of like a prelude to World War II. So the theme of the whole adventure is some power is doing something down here. You're going to go find out what that is. No one else knows of these totally important nations of Voluna and Furyandy 
what's really going on down here because news only travels as fast as someone can ride with a dispatch of their horse. So it's kind of like a Pony Express kind of a vibe. There's no magical t- communication happening between a crystal ball. No one's sending any magical little birds to deliver little notes tied to their feet. It's going to take an actual scout to jump on a horse and ride 300 miles to Valuna and tell the prince of that kingdom or someone to go all the way up to Chendal and tell them what's going on because if something really bad is going on, you're going to have to send the word out. So being the young ones who are... Uh, you know, not necessarily the most incredibly dynamically powerful experienced agents of the empire, if you want to know what I'm trying to say. You're somewhat kind of disposable, but you're not really being sent on a death mission. That's why the whole idea behind the mission is to infiltrate, you know, discover what forces are at play, intercept communication, collect intelligence, dispatch what you find, and then disrupt and disable. So, you know, you may need to go in disguise. You may want to go incognito. The players may want to skirt the edges. Let's put up the map of the city of the uh, village of Hamid that we drew, and let's take a look at that. We're going to move this out of the way. And let's get that overhead map gone. Here we go. So here's our map that we did a couple episodes ago, right? And we'll talk a little bit about this as we're talking about this next section. So, you know, the player's going to need to do some reconnaissance to figure out what's going on. And one other detail I failed to mention here is with, you know, without delay, they've traveled this route of this blue dash line, 340 miles to get to this region where the village of Hamlet is. So your gameplay really begins when you break out your battle map like this and everyone's got their miniatures ready to go and they're ready to discern what they're going to do. They're kind of coming in from the west and maybe from the north, but there's an important part here. Most really smart players will be like, oh, great, we'll go to Verbombank and we'll buy a bunch of plate mail and see if we can get any magic weapons at a shop and use a bunch of gold. Did they give us a bunch of money from Luna City to spend on what we need an expense account, right? You want to avoid that. What you want to do is you want the players to use just what they have on them. You don't want them to waste a bunch of time traveling down to Celine to have uh, Liz Fannin's family pitch in some cash. There's no time to waste. You guys need to go down there and do this mission now. You have what you need to do it now. It's about an infiltrate intelligence reconnaissance mission. It's not about a frontal assault. So with all that in mind, when the characters start coming this area, you can tell them this one important detail. So without delay and hardly knowing each other, the party travels 12 hexes, about 340 miles, to the outskirts of the region, but soon realize the roads north of Verbombok are overwhelmed and guarded. So you're kind of establishing right away, like, listen, going to Verbombok is a death trap. You are at the outskirts of the map. What are you going to do? So this is a great situation to put your characters in. They know they need to find out what's going on. They need to work together as characters who've never met each other before. They need to work together as players who've never, never met each other before. They also have the sense of like, we're just actually just a bunch of level one scrubs. How are we going to handle this? A frontal assault may not be that good of an idea. That's one thing we were designing the Crisis games, especially Crisis Warhead, where I was a creative director on it, is we try to make sure that they have these action bubbles where you could attack the level any way you wanted to do it. You could go in a frontal assault if you thought you could get away with it. You could infiltrate. You could snipe. You could do diversions. You could drive vehicles and set them on fire, all kinds of neat things. So what you want the players to do is approach this adventure thinking about, well, my goodness, what's going on, first of all? You know, what are we going to be able to do? Are we going to come in from this area here where this brewery is and slink around here under the cover of darkness? This is the end of the welcome winch right here. Are they going to circle around and come up this road? Do they need to watch what's going on, the traffic of these roads? I encourage you as a GM, as a DM, to understand that the North Road and even this bridge is going to be heavily guarded. This goes off to the moat house, which is already completely built. It's not the ruins of the moat house. It's the real moat house. So these roads are going to be patrolled. There's going to be patrols and maybe even checkpoints like you would have in World War II in Vichy, France. But there may be ways for players to slip in. They may be able to slip down the river at night. Like there's some famous novels that have a character that does that. I forgot the name of them. Um, they may want to try to go through the trees and inf- infiltrate one of these buildings. They don't want to have a situation when they want to raise an alarm. How guarded and how coordinated is the occupying forces? They may be occupying this area. Where about all the men? Where are all the men at? Are they've all been dispatched to build the other moat house type structure that's said in uh, the the temple elemental module that's being built to the west they don't know they need to figure that out do they want to try to come in through this way here no matter what happens you're going to have the first few game sessions be situations where the players are very carefully using kind of like stealth and infiltration to kind of poke and prod to get a sense of what's going on you might want to have them encourage them to go somewhere up high and then look down over the city and then you can create kinds of fabricate scenarios that give an idea like where this night watch meets in a town square and they stay here it's like 
two in the morning and they took the lodges out and then they all go to sleep. Or there may be an encampment of soldiers in the fields here. What you want to have happen is you want the players to figure out a way to kind of crack the nut of getting into this little village, talking to some of the locals who can tell them who follow the old religion, maybe even the Druid of the Grove, and find out what happened. When did these guys arrive? What do they want? What's going on? What's the situation at hand? Is there a French resistance happening behind the scenes? There is. So how can they get involved in that? What can they do to collect intelligence, do reconnaissance, disrupt, and send messages back? So that's pretty much our video for today. We want to give you an idea what the narrative and the setup is for the actual play. What I'm going to do for the remainder of the series is we're going to play it. So I'm not going to give you any more behind the scenes kind of stuff. I've got stuff worked out ahead of time. We're going to slowly and surely do probably one hour episodes at the most. We may try to break up into shorter episodes of what the party would be doing to try and poke and prod on these different types of situations to get a sense of how does this unfold. Now the one thing very tricky about my videos is I'm not doing this with six strangers. Okay, so it's not six strangers playing these individual characters. It's too hard in a modern world to get six people together to play these individual characters and also find six people that know how to play AD&D &D and find six people who have the same schedule. So we're going to do like we did with our Glacier Rift or Frost Giant Jarls. We're going to run it through. You'll see the house rules in action. We'll make decisions using dice rolls and things like that of what the characters want to do. And we'll turn it into a living novel. So what happens with these characters and what's going on behind the screens, uh, behind the scenes is going to really kind of come alive over the course of the next few months. So there we have it for now. Hope you enjoyed this. And ultimately at the end, we're going to give you a copy of all this stuff for free so you can run it your own way with your own friends and have a lot of fun with it too. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. We'll see you later.